And I wanna introduce our speaker today. So Jeff Qualls is a senior editor for a medical certification board, but in his spare time, he has been a space exploration enthusiast since he was about 10 years old. And now he is currently a JPL NASA solar system ambassador, and he's been doing that since 2016. And he thinks that's important because he wants more people to understand um, what we are doing and hope to do in space. And I know that this week has really inspired me <laughs> hearing all these amazing presentations. And we've been doing things for a long time. And so he's going to tell us a little bit about that and why you should support our space program. So Jeff, thank you so much again for being here. And I am going to let you take it away. All right. I'm going to share my screen here. All right. So let's get it going for the slideshow. All right. So uh, yes, I'm Jeff Qualls. And as Miranda just told you, um, I am a solar system ambassador. I also am an OSIRIS-REx ambassador and have been doing that for several years, uh, just uh, having a focus on this particular mission, uh, which is uh, an asteroid sample and return mission. Uh, I've been doing this uh, versions of this presentation at Astron Astronomy Days uh, for, I guess, the last five years now. So uh, this, this particular version of it is exciting because uh, the mission actually achieved its, its main success uh, just a few months ago in October. Uh, it did do the sampling and it was successful and we'll get into that uh, a bit later. Um, so uh, a lot of people wonder about that name, OSIRIS-REx. Uh, there you see the, uh, uh, what each of the letters of OSIRIS-REx stands for. I'm not gonna bother to read those out because no one will, will remember them. Um, but the name OSIRIS-REx, uh, that name comes from Egyptian uh, mythology. Osiris in, in Egyptian lore was uh, the god of fertility and the god of, uh, of the dead. Oddly enough, that those seem, things seem to be opposite. But, uh, uh, both of those things uh, relate to this mission and, and to our uh, desire to learn more about asteroids in general. Um, we, uh, we want to learn about asteroids because we think that perhaps asteroids that collided with Earth millions of years ago seeded uh, the building blocks of life on Earth uh, that might have uh, been the reason that life arose on Earth. So out of fertility, that kind of feeds in there. And also the thing about the God of, de of the dead, uh, as many of you know, uh, asteroids colliding with Earth in the past have, have uh, been the catalyst uh, for extinction events. Uh, and the big one everyone knows about is that uh, a large asteroid colliding with Earth uh, ended up um, killing off all the dinosaurs. So we want to learn about asteroids because they uh, can tell us about the origins of life on Earth, perhaps, and also because we really don't want to get slammed into by one of them. So the more we learn about them, the more we can maybe uh, avoid that uh, cataclysmic uh, event. So uh, I always like to start off this, um, this presentation talking about uh, the fact that OSIRIS-REx is not the first mission that we have sent to uh, an asteroid, and it's not the first sampling mission either. Uh, the Japanese uh, sent the first sampling mission, uh, uh, and it was called Hayabusa, and it, it, uh, it retrieved a small sample from an asteroid uh, named Itakawa um, back in 2010. Uh, this mission had its problems, um, it, it wasn't totally successful. Uh, it had planned to do things like um, to uh, drop a rover onto the asteroid and it failed in that. But it did return with about 1500 grains of material. And they learned a lot from this mission. It was, it was uh, an ion propulsion uh, system. And that was pretty new at the time um, where ions are, are projected out of the back uh, continuously instead of just like uh, one, one or two rocket bursts to get 
get the spacecraft to move. Uh, so anyway, they did learn a lot from Hayabusa and they did bring back some material, which was good, but they learned enough to do a second mission, uh, which was known as Hayabusa 2. And this mission was very successful. It did all sorts of things. And I'll tell you about a few of them in, in, in a minute. Um, and Miranda, if we have any time left at the end, I have like a two minute video that I wasn't sure would fit into this. But if we do have time, I would like to maybe uh, go back to that at the end, just as kind of a bonus. But Hayabusa 2 um, was planned to sample an asteroid named Raugu three different times. Um, and it also brought four different roving vehicles, although really they they are they were hoppers more than rovers because the gravity is so low on one of these small asteroids that uh, they they can't really roll around. So they have like sort of a uh, a weight shifting mechanism that causes um, the little little hoppers to kind of bounce around on the surface. And th these various rovers, they had four of them, and three of them were successful. Uh, and they. They uh, were operational on the surface for periods of like 16 hours or even a few days. And they did all sorts of things like uh, uh, measure uh, the surface composition with spectrometers. And uh, they had a magnetometer to see if uh, their asteroid Ryugu uh, had a magnetic field. They, uh, and they had a radiometer that tested the temperatures at various points in, in the day-night cycle of, of the asteroid. So, so this was a highly successful mission. Um, this is a photo that, uh, that Hayabusa 2 took of one of its sample sites. You see the, the sample site uh, uh, it, it, with the green circle around it. They actually dropped uh, a surface marker uh, on the uh, sample site so you could see it better. And over here, whoops. Um, Let's see. Sorry, I, I uh, there. Over here, you see the the shadow of Hayabusa two on the surface of the asteroid. Now, this is a close up of what that asteroid looked like, uh, and this was a surprise to the mission scientists uh, about how rugged it was. And and this will uh, this will be a recurring theme that you'll see when we get to uh, talking about the asteroid Bennu a bit later. But the surface of Ryugu uh, was very rugged and it made them have to think about the difficulty of going down there and grabbing a sample because all of these large rocks and boulders are, are dangerous. Uh, so they had to be a lot more precise in, in where they, they went to, to get the sample. Uh, these two pictures were taken by uh, uh, those hoppers or rovers uh, that went down, and it really looks like a strange, surreal environment down there. Um, so I wanted to show you this video, which is one of the sample sequences uh, that Hayabusa 2 uh, went through to, to bring back some material. So there, it's, it's moving now. Just take, take a look at this. That they actually shot a projectile into the surface to raise some of the material to go into the sampling horn. There you see it right there. And one of the, one of the times they went down, they they uh, they created a crater so they could get material from down below that hadn't been exposed to space. So I thought that was a an interesting um, way of doing it. Okay. So I just want to point out that uh, before I leave the subject of Hayabusa 2, uh, uh, Hayabusa 2 returned uh, its samples to Earth uh, just about a month or so ago. Uh, so, so that mission ended in great success. They thought they had gotten uh, a little less than a tenth of a gram of material in those two samples. That sounds like a tiny amount. But they, 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 when they opened up the, uh, the sample containers, they found out that they had uh, over five grams of material. So that's way more than they had hoped for. Uh, so uh, they, were, they, were, they were pretty lucky in that. 
And I wanted to point out also that the uh, mission team of OSIRIS-REx and the, and the Japanese space agency JAXA uh, have a, a collaboration agreement. Uh, they will share all the science information that both missions um, uh, obtain. And they will, they will also share small bits of the samples that they get from each mission. So that's, that's an exciting part of the mission that, that uh, the, the two uh, space agencies are going to share uh, everything they get from these two missions. So uh, as far as OSIRIS-REx is concerned, on your screen, you'll see the, the key mission objectives. Um, the first one was to map the asteroid because if you don't have a good idea of what that surface looks like, you uh, you won't know where to where to try to go down and get your sample safely, or as safely as you possibly can make it. And uh, they 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 wanted to thoroughly document that sample site, and they actually had four different uh, possibilities, which you'll see. Um, uh, they wanted to. Um, measure orbit deviations and i'll show you a video that explains that a little bit better um, but the reason you might you might think of this uh why we would want to know about orbit deviations uh that, that cause cause the orbit of asteroids to change um over time you want to know exactly where an asteroid especially a near-earth asteroid is uh in case in one of those times when it's coming close to Earth, it might actually impact. So there's this thing called the Yarkovsky effect that does, over time, change the orbits of these asteroids. Um, they wanted to compare what we could learn about Bennu from, from Earth to what we could know about it with, uh, with close observations um, using um, sensitive scientific instruments. And of course, the main goal was to uh, uh, collect and return a sample of the asteroid. Uh, this is a picture of the, the principal uh, investigator of the mission. His name is Dante Loretta. He works uh, at the Lunar and Planetary Lab uh, at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, my son and I were in Tucson a few years ago and we got, because I'm an OSIRIS-REx ambassador, I got the, the uh, personal tour of the Lunar and Planetary Lab, and we got to meet Dante Loretta. So I thought I'd show you this picture of us. I think this was in 2017. And you see, see Osiris Rex back behind Dr. Loretta there. Okay, so Osiris Rex uh, was sent to the asteroid Bennu. And I wanted to kind of tell you a, a little bit about that asteroid and how, how we chose that one. And this chart is a bit out of date, so I um, want to bring you up to date on at least a couple of those numbers. But they started at the base of this pyramid at, with the known number of asteroids at that time being uh, something over 7,000. Um, well, that, well, that's actually, I, that's not, I'm not showing the bottom of the screen. So uh, actually the bottom of the screen, the, the total number of asteroids, I think. You can see it, it says uh, about, around 500,000. Yeah, well, that, that number has gone up to 822,000 since then, over 822,000. And uh, uh, then the number of, of near earth asteroids um, is, um, it says there are seven, over 7,000, but there's actually uh, a very recent estimate of that is over 25,000. So these numbers have gone up a lot, um, but you get the idea. And uh, then, they, then they narrowed it down to the ones that had um, orbits that made it you know, easy to get to and easy to return from. And that at the time was 192, then they wanted it to be bigger than uh, 200 meters in diameter. At the time there were 26, and then they wanted to make sure that where they went was carbon rich, meaning that it had uh, organic material and a lot of it, and you know amino acids and things like that. And there were only five of those. So from those five, they narrowed it down to Bennu. And this uh, shows you a little bit about how you know Bennu comes close to Earth every once in a while. 
Uh, and you, you also see there that its original name was 1999 RQ36, pretty boring name. And we'll get into what, how it was changed in a, in a minute or two. But um, one thing that, you know, we kind of want to know about Bennu because there is a one in 2,700 chance that Bennu will collide with Earth uh, in about 170 years. So, you know, leave a, leave a, a a, a video for your grandchildren, you know, warning them that they need to be uh, watching out for that <laughs> in 170 years. Okay, so this is a, a little video to tell you about that Yarkovsky effect that does uh, end up changing the orbits of, of asteroids over time. So check this out. From a distance, everything in our solar system appears to be in its place. However, if you take a closer look, sometimes you can find asteroids, like Bennu, leaving their home in the inner asteroid belt and passing very close to Earth. Most other asteroids tend to stay grouped together in a few regions of our solar system, yet some still end up in our backyard. So once these asteroids get close, what makes the difference between a near miss and a potential hit? NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission will help better answer this question when it visits Bennu, but scientists think that a force called the Yarkovsky effect might be an important part of the answer. So how does this effect work? Well, like Earth, most asteroids rotate slowly as they move through space. During the day, the surface of the asteroid is illuminated by the sun, so it absorbs heat and grows warmer. During the night, however, the surface cools down, emitting the heat it absorbed as radiation. This radiation exerts a force on the asteroid, acting as a sort of mini-thruster that can slowly change the asteroid's direction over time. On larger asteroids, this doesn't amount to much, but on small ones, it can make a pretty large change over time. Because the surface emits the most heat radiation at the end of the day, the direction the asteroid rotates can ultimately determine what happens in the long run. Other factors, such as composition, asteroid shape, and surface features, can modify the magnitude and direction of the Yarkovsky thrust. By studying the Yarkovsky effect on Bennu with the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, NASA scientists hope to better predict how an asteroid might move through the solar system and whether it poses any danger to us here on Earth. So the next time an asteroid starts gradually moving into our neighborhood, we'll have a better idea of exactly where it'll end up. Okay. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, since uh, OSIRIS-REx has, has been in orbit of, of Bennu and has been taking all these measurements, they have found that uh, the rotation of Bennu is, is very slowly speeding up uh, because of the Arkowski effect. So they have learned something about it. Uh, um, now, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, they wanted to compare uh, what we could, could know about Bennu um, from Earth to, to what we could find out being very, very close. And this, this screen tells you, uh, shows you how how well we could even visualize Bennu uh, before we sent the mission there. And basically we could just see this, this blob. This is, these are radar images that were taken uh, before OSIRIS-REx ever got there and we really couldn't see much of anything um, um, that told you any detail about that asteroid. So uh, I wanna get to the part about um, how Bennu got its name. Um, the, the mission planners decided that it would be pretty boring uh, to send a probe to something called 1999 RQ-36. Nobody can really relate to that name. Um, so uh, they had a contest and they, they asked school children uh, what they would name the asteroid if they, if they could be the one to do it. Uh, and I think they had 8,000 kids who sent in suggestions for what, um, what they could name the, the asteroid. And they finally made, uh, they, they chose someone from right here in North Carolina. His name is Mike Puzio, and he's the one who came up with the name. And uh, here's a picture of, of Mike and me from last year's astronomy days. He has, uh, I, I met him at the very first talk that I gave on Osiris Rex. He was in the audience and he, he uh, raised his hand during, to ask a question and he, he wanted to know if I knew how Bennu got its name. And, you know, he just showed me up that I had not done that particular bit of the research. And he said, well, I named it. 
and I wasn't really sure if he was pulling my leg or not, but it turned out he was he was the one who named it. So uh, Mike is actually uh, with us today on the Zoom. So uh, Miranda, if you could uh, pull him up and, and let Mike tell us a little bit more about how he named Bennu, that would, that would be great. Well, uh, the, I took the mission's name, Osiris Rex. And from there, I then looked up about the god Osiris. Uh, and we've, we found that he returned after being killed by his brother to Earth as a Bennu. And I figured that would be a good name. And a Bennu is a heron, uh, pretty much just a big heron. A type of bird. Okay, uh, and, and Mike, you've got uh, to do uh, some special things because of your involvement, uh, uh, right? Uh, yeah, so I was, my family and I were personally invited by Bill Nye, the science guy, and <laughs> the then head of NASA, Charlie Bolden, uh, to go and watch the launch of the mission uh, to Bennu. And that was uh, an amazing experience. Both parts of it, I mean. Yeah. Uh, watching a rocket launch is awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and I just want to tell everybody, uh, and Mike was in the third grade when he, when he named Bennu. He's now, uh, you're a junior in high school now, right? At, at uh, North Carolina uh, School of Math and Science, right? Uh, that is correct. Okay, and he became an Eagle Scout uh, a year or two ago, I believe. So uh, Mike is uh, moving on to bigger and better things. So anyway, Mike, thank you for, uh, for helping me out again today. I, I really appreciate it. Of course, you're welcome. And uh, if anybody wants to ask Mike a question when we get to the end of this, uh, maybe he'll be willing to, to, uh, to answer questions. All right. Anyway, just uh, a couple of slides on, to kind of give us an idea of uh, some size perspective. Uh, this this uh, slide shows you how big Bennu is compared to some things that we all know, such as the the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower, uh, just relative sizes of them. And then this this slide gives you an idea of what how big uh, Osiris Rex is compared to Bennu. Um, this is what it would look like if you could see both of them in space. And then how big Osiris Rex is compared to an, an adult human. All right, this. This just gives you uh, the, the main highlights of, of what happened on this mission and what is still to happen in this mission. Um, uh, it was launched in 2016, as Mike uh, just talked about. Um, and then a, a year later, it, it uh, flew back around Earth to get a gravity boost uh, to push it out on toward uh, Bennu. And um, then it arrived uh, in close proximity to Bennu, Bennu in August of 2018, and eventually uh, moved itself in, into uh, a close orbit in December of that year. And be it began surveying the asteroid and mapping it and getting ready you know, for the series of things that would happen leading up to sampling. And the sampling did occur uh, last October 20th. And uh, it was very successful, and uh, we will we will um, show you that in just a minute. Now, uh, in just a, uh, um, a couple of months, in March, uh, the, the orbits will line up so that Bennu will be ready to fire fire its rocket engine and return home. And then, two years, a little bit, well, two and a half years later, uh, uh, Osiris Rex will. Uh, send its sample return container back to Earth and the scientists will get to look in there and see what they've got. So this is a picture of, of the liftoff and this is actually from, from the position where Mike and his family were. Uh, the photo was actually taken by a, 
a mutual friend of ours, uh, Jonathan Ward, who, who went to the launch with Mike's family. So you can just imagine being Mike and seeing this really awesome liftoff here. And I always like to, to include this picture because uh, it's, just a, it's just a really nice picture of the home planet. Uh, which was taken by OSIRIS-REx when it swung back uh, around Earth a year after launch to get that gravity assist to send it on to Bennu. And I also like to show this one because again, it, it gives us uh, uh, an idea about perspective. Um, you see this bright light right here, that is Bennu. So it looks pretty big there, right? Well, this is, the earth and the moon over here, these two small dots. And the reason Bennu looks so so big is because uh, Osiris-Rex was only 27 miles away from it at the time. So even though the earth and the moon are way bigger, both of them are way bigger than, Osir I mean, than Bennu, uh, they look very tiny just because they were 71 million miles away from Osiris-Rex at the time this photo was taken. So just wanted to share that with you. Okay, so you remember those blobby images I showed you a few minutes ago that were taken using radar um, from Earth. This is what uh, Bennu looks like up close. Pretty, a pretty rocky uh, mass of material, uh, just like the, the uh, other asteroid Ryugu was when uh, Hayabusa 2 got there. Um, so this is an early image from the mission and uh, one thing that they found out when they when they got there was that uh, there's evidence of of water in in the in the clay of the soil of Bennu. So that was pretty exciting to the uh, to the mission scientists, and uh, they believe that water can't really exist. Uh, can't the gravity on a, on an asteroid of this size is is too small for for the for the water to have gotten there any other way than to have, for Bennu to have been part of a, a larger object and broken away. So they feel like that's something that they, they learned pretty quickly, but they really are even more excited about looking at those samples to, uh, to see the evidence of that water uh, in the samples. All right, and this is a, a little video that was put together from a, a bunch of photographs that Osiris took just to show the rotation. And you can just see how, how rugged this place is. It really is like, a, like just a, a loosely held collection of rubble. And you see the, the very big boulders that, that jut out from the, from the edge of it uh, as, the, as Bennu rotates. All right, I'm gonna show you this video, which, is, uh, which shows the four uh, sample sites that they had narrowed it down to uh, before they actually did the sampling. I think you can hear me over this, um, but note that the four sample sites all have names of birds, so they kept with the theme of a bird um, that Mike started when he when he named this this asteroid Bennu. come out of this to get to the next slide. Okay, so so here, here you see some still pictures of all of the possible sample sites with the names of their birds and pictures uh, that, that they were named for. But um, you saw if you were if you were looking at, at the video that the sample sites, each of them were only about 10 meters in diameter. This was smaller than they had hoped. Um, for the sample sites to be because 
these places are so rugged that they had to get a lot more precise in the area that they targeted. So 10, 10 meters is, is really, you know, like a couple of parking spaces. So you can imagine, you know, how, how tricky it became that, so that uh, the, for them to, to go down toward the asteroid and uh, not hit anything, which would, you know, pretty much bring the mission to an end right there unsuccessfully. So Jeff, right. yes. Um, we have a question from Tina. And mm -hmm. in, in those um, photos of the sample sites, it looks like um, in most of them, it looks like a little, like a little crater or divot in the um, surface. Yeah. Um, was that just, you know, randomly there or were those actually sample sites that where those craters were caused by the sample harvest? No, those are just craters that existed uh, at those sites. We, did, we didn't do anything to, uh, to, to make those. Uh, that's just, that just happens to be, you know, what they look like. Interesting. It looks like maybe just like bullseyes of like, oh, these look like good spots. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, as you, you can see those large rocks and boulders that they, they, they made it very dangerous for the, for the uh, spacecraft to go down in those small slots. There wasn't much room for error. But I'm going to give you a closer look at the, at the primary sample site, which was called Nightingale. This, this will be like you're flying over it. And I want you to see this, this particular feature here, this large boulder. For you Lord of the Rings fans, they, they nicknamed this one Mount Doom because if, if uh, Osiris Rex had veered into that and, and, and you know, even just part of the spacecraft had hit that, that would have been spelled doom for the mission. So uh, the, the part they were aiming for was right in here. Once, and th this shows you the spacecraft going back up. That's what, what happened after the actual sampling took place. Uh, it pushed away. All right, let's see if I can get out of this. Yeah, there, all right. Now this video shows uh, the actual uh, sampling sequence. So let me just go right through with that. Shows you everything that happened Plus one thing that they ended up deciding not to do, and I'll tell you why in a minute. As it, when it went down and made contact with the surface, it actually uh, sprayed nitrogen gas to, to lift up material and push it into those sample containers, which are on either side of the mechanism there. And that ended up working really well. Okay, this right here where the spacecraft is spinning, this was meant to um, give them an idea of, of uh, the weight of the material. They, they could measure the mass and figure out the weight from that if they did that spinning uh, maneuver at the end of the process. Well, they found out, they decided they didn't want to do that and they had a very good reason for it uh, after they did the sampling. So, all right, I am, going to show you this actual sample sampling uh, right here. So this is the payoff. That's Doc Tayloretta right there. Okay. Um, so 
I didn't know this until a couple of nights ago when I was just uh, kind of doing a little research for this talk, but uh, that moment when all of the material flew up, uh, the uh, sample head actually pushed into the surface of, of Bennu at least uh, 19 or 20 inches and maybe as much as a couple of feet. So that just kind of really uh, brings home the point that, that, uh, that Bennu is really just a collection of, of, of loosely held together rubble because uh, uh, that sampling arm pushed in a lot further than they thought it was going to. Um, but uh, what, the, what, they, what they think they got, they got that their original uh, hope was that they would get um, maybe 60 grams. That was, that was the minimum they wanted to get, 60 grams or 2.1 ounces of material. But they ended up filling those sample uh, canisters uh, to the brim. And uh, they, they think they got as much as two kilograms which is equal is, is the same as 4.4 pounds of material. So that's a lot of material, which actually caused them a bit of a problem. And I'll show you on this, on this final video, which shows the, the sample canister being stored in the sample return container. So um, hold on, let me get the presentation mode back. All right. They actually got so much material that, they, that the top didn't completely close. There was some something that was jamming it open. You see all this, these little bits of stuff. It was actually losing material. So they just, and you can even see a bit of it as it's being stored. But they thought if they did that spinning maneuver that they would lose more material. So they decided it wasn't worth finding out exactly how much it, it weighed. And they could just wait on that until they get it home but they they took pictures and they those those canisters are jammed full so they think they got something at least close to the 4.4 pounds of material so that's exciting and there you see the date that it's supposed to return to earth september 24th 2023 and there you go so so far this has been a extraordinarily successful mission and we just got to get those samples back now. Um, so Miranda, do you think we should go to questions now or or should, should I show that two minute video that I was talking about earlier? Um, <clears throat> I have uh, one question. And so um, right now, before it returns, is it still kind of hanging, is um, Osiris Rex still kind of hanging around Bennu? Yeah, it's in orbit, and it's just, it's really, it's, I'm sure th that it's taking measurements while it's there, and maybe some more pictures and everything, but essentially, that part of the mission has, has come to a conclusion, and, they, and they're just waiting for the orbits to align so that it's the best time to, to fire the engine. Awesome. And, um, and that'll just be in like uh, just a couple of months. All right. Well, um, if you want to show the video and then we'll go to more questions. Okay. Hold on one second. Uh, this video I want to show you um, is of, about the Hayabusa 2 mission. And I just wanted to show you one of the rovers and how it worked. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Let's see. <laughs>
Okay. So I just thought that was kind of cool. Um. <laughs> it's so interesting learning about like um, the workarounds for like the engineering challenges, I guess, for like, you know, you're sending um, a spacecraft or, you know, a mission to somewhere that you're not exactly sure <laughs> what's going to be happening. I mean, yep. that little flipping mechanism inside that box is just yep. so interesting. That was the best way they could think of to move that yeah. thing around. It must so, be fun to be an engineer working on um, challenges like that. I think it must be. Um, before you, you you get any questions in, I just wanted to put in a plug. There's another um, program about Osiris Rex coming up later today, and it's it's uh, by one of the mission scientists, right, Miranda? Yeah. So yeah, and it we can drop that link in the chat if you would like to register for that. Um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Pierre, uh, how do you say his name? Um, um, in my Honicor? something like that. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's at two p.m. today, and I'm sure going to be uh, listening. You'll get more detail from from this guy who's on the inside of the mission than, than I've given you. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that one. Yep. Yeah, we have a lot of great um, presentations for the rest of the day. So, um, and we will be dropping the links um, to the that program page um, before the end of the program. Um, and can you um, remind us how big Bennu is? Uh, it's, it's about 500-ish uh, uh, me, uh, meters in diameter. And you compared it to about the height of like the Empire State Building, is that right? Yeah, it's a I think it's a little uh, bigger than, um, than um, let's see. Yeah, a little bigger than the the Empire State Building. It says there about about 510 meters. Wow. Yeah. And such an interesting shape too. Yeah. <laughs> Someone commented that it's it's pretty round for an asteroid. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see how it's kind of thick, fatter in the middle. They found out that it does eject a bit of material, like a comet. Not not it not so much that it is a comet or anything like that, but. Uh, it does eject some material um, from the from the um, north and south pole, and that material goes into orbit for a little while, and then it, it settles back down, mostly around the middle. So that's how it got um, it got that weird kind of bulgy middle part. Yeah, that's really cool. Yep. And so um, when it does its sample return, um, I guess it'll get close to Earth, and then. Um, how, what's going to happen? Is it going to shoot off that capsule? Yes, uh, the, the whole um, spacecraft is not coming home. And uh, I have heard that they are thinking about repurposing the rest of the, of the uh, spacecraft uh, to go out and maybe fly by other asteroids. Uh, but I, I'm, I don't believe that's been settled yet. Awesome. Yeah, that was my question earlier. Like, what happens to Osiris Rex after it <laughs> drops off its uh, sample return? Um, yeah, I think they're going to end up, you know, using it, uh, you know, depending on how much fuel is left and all, all of that, but uh, to try to do a little bit more mission science. And so I know that, um, you know, the engineers um, that work on these um, missions have very precise calculations. So do they know exactly where the sample return is going to land? Um, yeah, they do. And uh, I think it's going to be uh, in Utah. Cool. Yep. And, uh, you know, they'll have uh, recovery units uh, ready to uh, get there and pick that thing up pretty rapidly. But they certainly don't want unauthorized people <laughs> to uh, get anywhere near that thing when it once it hits the ground. They're not yeah. dropping off the exact coordinates on the NASA website. <laughs> Uh, it, will, it will parachute uh, to a soft landing. One of the things that didn't go well with that original Hayabusa mission is it came in uh, like a bullet and, uh, and it did not have a soft landing. And they were concerned that the sample that they brought back from that asteroid may have been contaminated. They ended up deciding that it really hadn't been, but uh, that was a worry because it didn't land soft. So. And um, um, Hans has a question. Um, 
Um, they said, does Benny tumble or rotate on an axis? And that shape um, seems like it's pretty consistent with, you know, a pretty regular spin. Yeah, it, it, it rotates on an axis. And I meant to say this in there, but I'll tell you that it, 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 its rotation is pretty fast and uh, it, it completes a rotation every 4.3 hours. So uh, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty fast. And so since Bennu, um, you know, we're thinking now that it's really just kind of a collection of a bunch of um, debris together. Yeah. If, an, if an asteroid that is like not quite as solid as, you know, I think of just like a big rock tumbling in space um, were to enter Earth's atmosphere, would it stay in its form or do you think it would kind of break apart? It would depend on how solid it was. I think uh, you know if it's if it's if it's if it's kind of loose. I think you would see a lot of fragmentation and and pieces you know peeling off and going in different directions. But if it's if it's more more solid, that's not as likely to happen. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, and Hans is also asking, why does the material that's ejected end up on the middle of the asteroid? So I guess it's just being pushed kind of out. Well, you know, I'm no physicist or anything like that, but, uh, but it, it goes into a, a, an, a, a br an orbit and orbits around the, the ra around the middle and that's where it settles. So, uh, you, might want to come back at 2 p.m. and ask uh, <laughs> Dr. Hanacor uh, that question, and he could probably give you a more precise answer. Awesome. All right. So I don't think we have any more questions. Let me check. Let's see. Oh, um, Carol asked, what do you think is the most important aspect of the mission? And so why are we sampling asteroids in general? Like, what are we trying to find out? You know, besides like, will they kill us one day? And that's why we're keeping <laughs> up. <laughs> I certainly think that's important, you know, trying to stop them from killing us. But uh, I, I, you know, I kind of like the idea of learning more and more about, um, you know, how life started on, on earth. And I think that they, you know, they're, they're heading in the right direction. Um, going to these places that have, have been largely un, undisturbed since the formation of the solar system, you know, 4.6 billion years ago, that's probably how old uh, the material is going to turn out to be that we bring back from, from Bennu. So kind of pristine. And, uh, you know, the more we can learn about the origin of, so, of the solar system, the more we learn about, um, you know, the earth and, and how life got here. So that's, that's kind of where, where my interest lies right there. But I certainly want to know whether something's coming toward us that might kill us too. <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but um, everyone's saying thank you. They learned a lot. And uh -huh. um, again, we're going to drop some links in the chat um for the upcoming programs for the rest of the day so definitely go over to naturalsciences.org and go to our astronomy days page to look at what we have coming up again if you want to learn more about osiris rex you can check out that 2 p.m program as well and jeff thank you so much for um being here and telling us about it early this morning um i learned so have learned so much this week <laughs> during astronomy <laughs> days i think my brain is just so full and it's going to take me like three months to process it all but i am super excited about um the missions that are coming up in the next few years and i'm excited for like maybe a new age of space exploration that we're embarking upon now and you know hopefully we can get somewhere near the excitement that you know was had in the the 60s um yeah but who knows? We'll see. Well, Miranda, <laughs> I just want to thank you and the museum for allowing me to do this again. I enjoy it every year. So thanks for the opportunity. Thanks everybody for coming. Yep. And Jeff, Jeff gives us updates um, about every year on Osiris Rex. And so. Um, and other, other things too. Other things. Yeah. So yeah, maybe, maybe there won't be as many updates next year, um, but in 2024, I'm sure you'll have lots to say. <laughs> oh yeah. Can't wait for that. Yeah. That'll be great. 
Yeah, and we do have missions uh, or um, programs on these missions and these landings and these takeoffs at the museum frequently. We have one on the Perseverance um, landing on Mars. That's the newest Mars rover is gonna be landing on Mars on February 18th. So keep an eye on our website, naturalsciences.org for that program. And if you're registered for any program during Astronomy Days, you're probably gonna get an email about that program as well. So you can come and check it out. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. We hope to see you at more programs today during the last day of Astronomy Days. Um, thank you to NC Space Grant for sponsoring Astronomy Days this year. And if you would like to pick up some space gear, including our um, in-house design of the solar system, you can head over to the store on the website and pick up a zip hoodie or a t-shirt. Um, thank you to our museum members. Um, thank you for your support for all of our programs and everything that we do. Um, you can learn about being a member if you'd like to at the website. And thanks again. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.